I'll switch to, um, to English. Uh, I'm not part of the seminar, but I'm, I'm, I'm part of the of the of the reason why I'll get to here, so I'll say some words. Uh, Adrian Tanner, Professor Adrian Tanner, Memorial uh, uh, Memorial University, Newfoundland, uh, wrote this book uh, that many of you know already, Bringing Home Animals, and in the, is a world famous author in the subject of human animal relations, interactions, and the Inu. He's been working with the Cree, with the Inu, with the native people of northern Canada and Quebec. Uh, I came across this book when I started uh, finding interest in human animal interactions and I found it fascinating. <coughs> Two years ago I had the pleasure of meeting Adrian and I had the pleasure of visiting him in Labrador and uh, I learned a lot from this, from the book and from my talks with him and we thought it would be a very nice idea of asking Adrian to come over uh, the very short distance from St. John to Newfoundland to Tel Aviv, Israel, in order to share with us some of his stories about the Inu and their relationships with, uh, with animals. And this is what we ask Edwin to do. So please, please, Professor Edwin, tell me. Institutional host, the uh, University of Tel Aviv, and my human hosts, uh, Ram Bakai and Guy Stiebel, who have shown me when I ha haven't been in Tel Aviv at these meetings, um, showing the parts of this beautiful country of yours that they have particular expertise in. So I've been incredibly privileged. Have an amazing experience uh, visiting this world. The Inu are an indigenous people occupying the central and eastern parts of North America, uh, of the boreal forest region of Canada. They were previously known by various names Cree, Montagnier, or Nascarpe. They are not to be confused with the Inuit people who live in the tundra region north of the boreal forest, people who used to be known as the Eskimo. The similarity between Inu and Inuit is purely coincidental, it has no linguistic significance. I, I will talk today about two specific Inu groups, um, uh, the, um, those living on the James Bay side of the Quebec Labrador Peninsula. This is the Quebec Labrador Peninsula, St. Lawrence River. Uh, this is my province of Newfoundland, and this is Labrador. And these are where the Labrador Inu. There are other Inu groups in between, uh, but I'll only talk about those two. And then further of the same language family in, uh, reaching right across the border with the forest region. One major difference between the two groups uh, is that for the Labrador Inu, the caribou is absolutely essential to their way of life, both as food and spiritual. While for the James Bay Inu, the important game animals are moose, beaver, and geese, while the bear is the most important animal in terms of its sacredness and the power of its spirit. I will later show how this difference between these two groups results in them having different kinds of land tenure systems. Since the mid-1970s, the Inu have lived in government-built houses and settlements. Oops. There we go. That's um, a few of the government-built houses that Miss Disson, you know, one of the communities. You know, James Bay Inu But in the late 1960s, when I first went to stay with them, most lived for most of the year in nomadic hunting camps in groups of three to five families. 
from September to the following June. Yes. Well, most of the EU tent structures were of canvas and rectangular or oval in ground plan. Probably a more traditional structure was the conical Michua, shown here. Uh, actually, it looks very similar to what we know as the tipi, but while well, the tipi has a triangular base structure around which other poles are added in the doorway. The Michua has a four pole uh, structure around which um, uh, the other poles, the Rakhidas, the other poles are added. Today, this kind of dwelling is most often found today in the coastal region, James Bay region, because the jack pine grows there, a type of tree that provides the long straight poles needed for this kind of tent. A variation on the Michua is the Shwapukwan, I'm afraid I have a picture, which is like two half Michuas, two semicircular structures joined together with a, with a ridge pole against which other poles are leaned. Um, uh, where are we? Okay, uh, the Shwapukwan um, has a doorway at either end, and while it may have once been used as a multi-family residence, several fireplaces uh, along the center. It is now mainly used as a feast tent at, at contemporary ceremonies. Prehistoric examples of the shepherd one have been found. During the coldest part of the winter, several families of a hunting group move into a communal lodge. Oops, yes, that's the outside of a communal lodge with a family others outside. Splitting wood while I was taking pictures. Um, uh, uh, where are we? Yes, inside. Uh, okay. Um, during the coldest part of the winter, several families of hunting group move into a communal log walled lodge. Inside the lodge, each family has uh, its own section. A winter lodge is used for only one season as the group does not return to the same specific location for many years because by the time they leave, they will have used up all the firewood, spruce boughs, and moss, uh, moss used for chinking and for um, baby diapers, as a matter of fact. <coughs> may talk about that later. Uh, from, from the immediate area of the camp. Heating and cooking is provided by a tin wood stove. Uh, although in a meat swap, there may be an open fire instead, particularly uh, not in the coldest parts of the winter. There is always a large, on this slide, especially for Rand, <laughs> a stock, stock of fire, rather fire every time we pass a, a, a pile of firewood. With, with pleasure. <laughs> uh, it went when we visited Labrador. Anyway, <laughs> heating cooking, uh, where, where are we? There is always a large stock of firewood. Spruce boughs are used for flooring, which are regularly replaced. This is a lady get, uh, hauling in a, a load of spruce boughs. And here we have them. This was actually in a loop, new lodge. This was the first layer of spruce boughs after the lodge had just been completed. Is this um, is for, for to isolate it? Pardon? What, what is the purpose? The, uh, it keeps the place nice, clean smelling, and uh, fresh and, and clean. Day by day, these spruce boughs will dry out and also various things get dropped on the ground, and so every few, every week or so, they will replace the flooring. So, uh, as you saw the lady uh, holding in the, the fire. And, and, and so, uh, 
you have a fresh carpet and you spend all your time while you're inside the thing either kneeling, sitting, or lying down. Uh, you know, nobody stands up in the, you know, just to come in and out. And, and so it's very nice and comfortable to have this fresh layer of fruit spouts or balsam. This the, actually the best you can find balsam fir. It's a very sweet, uh, pleasant smelling um, uh, um, uh, um, branches. Okay, where are we? Yes, heat and dripping large. In the short summer season of July and August, <coughs> several hundred Inu would assemble at one of the trading posts. That's the Hudson Bay Company post at Mistissini, uh, which was a, uh, a trading post uh, where many of the hunting groups would assemble. And where they, while at the trading post, they live in, in tents. Uh, this is an uh, Anglican church, but uh, the tents that people lived in in the, in the summertime. This, is the, this year is the 350th anniversary of the first trading post established in the James Bay, among the James Bay Inu. For some years prior to that, at least after 1600 AD, the Inu would have had some limited access to European trade goods via intertribal trade from neighboring groups. Although they have traded fur for European tools over this long period, fur production was always only a small part of their economy. <coughs> their main activity was directly producing the food they ate by hunting and fishing. In fact, the main fur they traded, beaver, was just as important to <coughs> Inu as a source of meat. European tools would have made their hunting activities more efficient, but in my view, trade hardly changed the fundamentals of the Inu way of life. Since they spent most of the year far away from and out of control of traders, missionaries, or government officials. And because they continued to depend on hunting animals for food, as they had done since before European contact, they maintained many of their traditional activities, beliefs, and rituals involved, involving game animals after the arrival of the fur trade. The Inu were converted to Christianity a century or more ago, but while the missionaries were critical of Inu traditional spiritual beliefs and practices, they were only in contact with them for short periods in the summer, so they failed to put an end to these practices and beliefs. I was fortunate enough to live with the Inu of James Bay at a time when they were still following much of these ancient activities and beliefs at the same time as following Christian worship during the short summer period. The Inu had adopted mostly European clothing by the end of the, by the mid 20th century, but they still used their own decorated items to cover the extremities of the body, for the feet, the head, and the hands. They prefer their own Hand, handmade moccasins, these are the pair I use, I wore most of the winter, um, mitts, uh, and, um, and also hats, I don't have a picture of a decorated tree hat. The decorations on these items, as well as those on other hunting equipment, were explained as intended to please and attract the game animals. Inu hunters usually wore relatively light jackets. You see with these two men going off hunting. Uh, this man is, is hauling a beaver <coughs> using a special ceremony of hauling string from a new hunt. But as you see, it's 30 degrees below zero, and they're just in what look like relatively light jackets. Um, without hoods. 
despite temperatures of 30 degrees below and colder. In the forest, hunters tend to be sheltered from the wind, and the activity of walking on snowshoes produced adequate body heat. The lack of a hood also allowed them to be more aware of their surroundings. Today, much heavier hooded parkas are needed since most people now use snowmobiles. People mainly travel by walking on snowshoes. Snowshoes are a real item. It both combines the, you know, the, the, the um, frame made by the men, comes from, from particular trees. The, um, the lacing is from, um, uh, usually the inner lacing is from caribou, caribou hide that has been cut into very long strips and <coughs> bulky, whereas the, <coughs> the, um, the lacing Dog teams of uh, um, happened to be from a lecture almost given by an elder just a couple of weeks ago when I was in northern Quebec, uh, where they were debating about traditional Inu culture. And so the elder here, this man here, um, brought all his different snowshoes and told a story about each each pair. Uh, so that um, and, you know, this is one of this meeting we were having were on the preservation of Inu culture, and with the predominant use of snowmobiles now and ATVs, and, and, and now there are a lot of highways and forest roads in the area, and people use pickup trucks. So that uh, this is one of the endangered uh, parts of the snowmobile culture that he, that this elder chose to to use as his focus for preservation of tradition. Um, dog teams were also used in winter at the time I was in the there in the Japanese Army, the long narrow snowshoes. Um, people, um, people, uh, dog teams were also used in winter and canoes were an essential um, part of, of because people went in the bush, went in at the end of the open water season, often ferrying the stuff. This guy, this canoe is pretty heavily loaded, both with people and with stuff, uh, moved out to their camp. And then when freeze up comes, they switch from canoes to snowshoes and sleds. Um, and canoes were essential. Now, at the hunting camps during spring breakup, there is a period with both snow and some open water, so that both canoes and sleds were used at the same time. Uh, and here you see we went, uh, these canoes had been left at the first camp we had uh, settled, uh, established in the fall, the previous fall, and this is in the spring, and we use the dog team to ferry the, um, the, 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 the canoes back to where we needed them, where there was already open water. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, in the open water, you can pile the, the sleds into the, into, the, into the canoes. So that um, you need both kinds of transportation, or did in the past when people lived in the bush for eight to ten months a year. Um, while the hunting of large animals is mostly done by the men, women do much of the work of butchering and preparing the hides. Women do do some hunting in the immediate area of, of the camp, uh, small, small game and uh, a lot of collecting firewood and that. Uh, this is a young lady her mother is supervising her uh, scraping of beaver hide on the stretch to see, but that's what it is. Um, hunters, uh, women 
also make and repair clothing throughout the winter. Hunters wear through several pairs of moccasins over the winter, so that the women are continually making new pairs. Oh, sorry, this is sorry, this is <coughs> strange. You know, the, 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 sometimes a whole fan. This is this is um, part of the process uh, of preparing uh, tanning a, a caribou hide. Uh, in this case, after it has been washed and stretched, and, uh, and that it was taken outside in extremely cold weather. Stretch out of these um, stakes, put, put in the, thrown into the snow, and frozen, and then you can scrape it uh, very efficiently. <coughs> anyway, um, hunters also periodically wore out their snowshoes so that they would be continually being repaired and new ones made, while men, with men making the frames and women placing them. One on the subject of the Inu hunting territory, that is, the areas to which particular family groups would return year after year, a rather fruitless debate raged some years ago among anthropologists as to whether they were of pre-Columbian origin or a result of the European fur trade. <coughs> Many scholars assumed that people at the so-called hunting stage of social evolution could not have owned land. I am of the view that regardless of the fur trade, with, relati with relatively sedentary gain, hunting territories functioned as an efficient way to ensure everyone spread themselves evenly over the land so that all had some kind of access or had access to gain. Moreover, with hunting territories, each group could harvest without overhunting in order to help sustain animal populations over the long term. More or less sedentary species like beaver, bear, or moose, and some of these species would have been very easy for the Inu to overexploit without the kind of system of game management that the hunting territories. While I was showing a, a, a lady while she's minding a baby in the, in the, in the hammock here, she's also working up <coughs> on a pair of solutions, not a pair of um, moccasins. So, part of the rule of showing respect to the animals is never wasting any part. This means that people would not want to kill animals they did not need. They would therefore stop hunting, trapping, or fishing particular animal species once they had enough to fulfill their needs for the foreseeable future, preferring leisure instead. Inu hunters sometimes allow younger animals to go free, since, given their ownership of the territories, they would know that these animals would be available for them to harvest in later years. At the same time, any passing hunter from another group is allowed to kill any animal they happen to come across on another group's territory, providing they inform the territory owner, and in the case of fur bearers, they give any fur from animals they caught to the territory owner. However, for the Inu of Labrador, and this is where this contrast comes in, their main things from species for the Inu of Labrador, who depend on caribou, um, uh, do not have access to sedentary animals like moose in their region, and there are relatively few beaver. The caribou move about a lot, so the Labrador Inu who depended on caribou tended to move frequently to where the game was. In some cases, the game where a caribou assemble or they, they pass. They go on migrations and, and uh, particular places, often well-known places such as river crossings, the Inu would gather there in large groups to, to harvest them. At other times when the caribou were scattered, the people had to scatter. So hunting territories simply would not work under those 
the circumstances. As a consequence, the hunting territory system could not function in the outdoor environment. The diet of the Inu was mainly meat. For the James Bay Inu, beaver was one of the staple foods and was eaten almost every day. It's a particularly important species to the Inu. Unlike most mammals who, who gain fat during the summer and then make use of their own fat during the winter so that towards the end they are pretty, uh, pretty scrawny and have very little fat on them. Unlike those animals, and that includes moose, uh, caribou, uh, and, and other animals, the beaver maintains a food supply at the bottom of, of his beaver pond and eats, uh, maintains, eats throughout the winter, maintains a thick layer of body fat throughout. So if you catch beaver uh, at any time of the winter, you have, as well as a, a fur to be traded, and, uh, and you know, probably 50 pounds of meat, that meat is such high quality and it has a high amount of fat on it. Other main sources of food were moose. Now, this is beaver, sorry. This is showing um, the butchering of two beavers. This, this one has just removed the, 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 uh, the hide. Whereas this one, the, the beaver has has had uh, much of its meat removed, and there's a the skeleton of the leg. And there's a particular form of cooking beaver where you separate the fat part and the lean part and cook the two separately. Um, uh, okay, yeah, that's that is the beaver. The other main source of food is moose. This was after the first moose we caught of the season. Two, two moose were caught. And this is, and you can see the heads there. I got the impression that they were almost displayed. They brought all the meat in the house and it stayed there for half a day while they were working on it. It seemed to be as much a display uh, of the first moose of the season as much as it was the necessary part of there butchering process. Okay, where are we at moose? Um, caribou also found in this region in not as many numbers, not large numbers as in the uh, Labrador side. This is a young caribou, or a mature caribou they killed. This is a beaver hide on a stretcher, by the way, being ready for, for you know, our, our excellent their boomer highs and get a very high price for them on the market. Okay, where were we? Um, moose, caribou, fish. The Inu you know, fish throughout the year. In the winter, you uh, chop holes in the ice and either jig it. But this is a bunch of net, net meaning that what they did when they first arrived at this lake was two holes in the ice. They have a gadget of their own design using ropes that drags a rope across under the ice to the second hole and then they pull the net <coughs> down under the ice and leave it there checking the net every day and putting it back. So you get a, a, uh, a, uh, a source of fish throughout Fish. In the spring, the Inu dried meat that was, that was being cut in strips. This is in the spring. You still see a bit of snow lying around, but it's, it's spring. They make these scaffold and just keep a smoky fire here. Not as much for drying as simply to keep any flies off the meat. Uh, and, and, it, uh, uh, and so that the meat. And after it's dried, it's powdered. This is the meat after it's been 
pounded by hammering it with a, today they use the back of an axe, but they have a special pounding tool we know from what um, in, in the past to, to produce this powder meat, which would be later used, uh, it keeps very well, can be used in soups uh, and for chemicals. Pemmican is a mixture of berries, powdered meat, and fat. In the 20th century, some imported items were obtained from traders, some flour, lard, and sugar, for example, but only in limited quantities due to the difficulty of transporting supplies, uh, enough of these uh, supplies to last them throughout the whole winter. Animal fat is of special appeal to the Inu. There is no single Inu term in, the, in their language for animal fat. Instead, there are names for different kinds. Fat that covers the muscle meat, for fat that covers the intestines, and for the thin layer of fat that covers the chest cavity. I myself, and I should say I was brought up in England as a vegetarian, started eating meat when I moved to Canada, but uh, um, living with the Edo, uh, lived on a diet where, from my calculations, every eat approximately two pounds of meat a day. Um, but as I say, I myself grew to crave fat uh, when living with the Edo. Apparently, I hypothesized prompted by my activity in the cold weather. But anyway, you know, I didn't like fat before I went to the Inu because I came to love it. One way the Inu obtain fat is by crushing the ends of the long bones of caribou and moose after the marrow has been extracted and boiling the crushed bones to extract the fat. The fat is then skimmed off and allowed to solidify and it is often eaten eaten in that way. The liquid left, that is left after the fat has been removed is called muskumi and is a kind of ceremonial soup that is, is served. I say ceremonial, it's sort of carried around by the children and the elders always get the first soup. <laughs> so it has some kind of uh, ceremonial importance. Uh, the Labrador Inu in particular hold a special feast called the Mokoshan, at which chunks of fat from the long bones, namely of caribou, along with chunks of bone marrow, are served with great ceremony, uh, and again, particularly to the elders, um, certainly the elders first. Bear fat, which when rendered retains a liquid form, is also treated by the Inu as a sacred substance. Turning to the issue of how the Inu think about and relate to the animals they hunt, and in terms of today's topic of this meeting, these are not really treated or seen as wild animals as European or Western science would classify. Neither do the animals think of the animals, apart from domesticated dogs, as tame. They treat game animals as somewhere in between wild and tame. Instead of being treated as wild animals, they are treated as part of the Eno hunter's social world. As with other social relations, hunters must continually work to maintain good relations with animals. At most times, relations between animals and hunters are good, such that the Inu interpret a successful hunt as the animals having given themselves willingly to worthy hunters who have shown respect to the animals in the past. Yet in other instances when hunting is more like a in, yet in other instances hunting is more like a battle of wills between the hunter and the reluctant game. And at such time the hunter may may be reduced to trickery so in order to, to, to kill the animal. For the Inu, there are other truly wild animals in their world, various kinds of monsters, 
some of whom, such as the Adush, are believed to hunt and eat humans. These are creatures that modern science would consider mythical beasts. Inu hunters communicate with the animals that they hunt, and they believe the animals or the spirits that control each species also communicate with them. Hunters communicate with animals by the means of drumming. And also by in various forms of shamanism. The animal spirits, in their turn, communicate to the hunters by means of dreams, visions, and in the shaping tent ritual. In this latter ritual, a shaman enters a small tubular tent that is open at the top. After a while, the voice of her is heard of a host spirit who then translates for the various other spirits who arrive. The other spirits speak in voices in whistles and, and that that are unintelligible to humans, but there is one goat, uh, uh, a host spirit, who, who translates, and which are also heard by the audience who sit around outside the tent. With the arrival of spirit, the, the tent begins to shake violently, questions are shouted from the audience, and the spirits may answer. Some of the spirits tell jokes. The Inu believe that they must, above all, show respect to the animals they hunt. They must never do anything that could be interpreted as making fun of an animal. They must never brag about any of their success they may have as hunters. If they do not follow these rules, they may not be successful in their future hunting. In addition to paying attention to their dreams, which are always shared, discussed, and interpreted by the whole group, hunters may also practice one of several kinds of divination to indicate where they will encounter the animals that they are hunting. One form of divination is burning the shoulder bone interpreting the resulting child marks. Uh, this, um, each, this is the little sh shoulder blade of a arctic hare. Um, different species of animals, the shoulder blades of different species of animals are used. It is said that, for example, a porcupine is a very slow animal, and so it's divination is the, 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 the oracle or the message from the bone of a porcupine will take a long time to come true. Whereas a hare being a very flighty and rapid animal, it, it, that divination refers to the next day. We used to burn these things twice a day because, uh, to, to, uh, because they only their forecast only lasted a short while. Certain taboos must be followed while hunting. It is an offense to, to the animal itself to track it by walking in its tracks on the snow. Hunters must also treat animal properly when they kill them. After butchering an animal, after butchering an animal where it is killed, it is taboo to leave snow on the end. I mean, this is just to show butchering, but um, after we pile all the stuff onto the sled to take back, the, the whole site was cleaned up by sprinkling fresh snow on it to cover it in, in a sign of chloroquine. When hunters are heard returning to the camp by the people inside the dwelling, the latter must not rush out to greet them. They must remain silent while the hunter enters and slowly, without pride, reveals what they have caught. Each, each, by each hunter giving his decorated hunting bag, called a Nuodan, to his wife or, uh, or his sister. If the hunter has killed a major game animal, 
too large to, for him to have brought back on his own, he will have brought back token parts, such as the legs of a moose. With all modesty, this is me 50 years ago, <laughs> dragging a, a, the legs of a moose, and again using a Nima pack. Um, He will bring back these tokens, such as the legs of moose shown here, dragged by a second special colored ceremonial dra dragging string called a nimapan. The hunter may also bring back in their hunting bag special parts of the intestine or the fetuses of a pregnant female. And these are the fatty, the fat around the intestines that one token that's always brought back when you first kill an animal, and here are two uh, fetuses of, uh, that were also brought back at the same time. Um, a piece of intestine fat is placed in the mouth of each fetus, after which it is skinned and butchered as if it was a full-grown animal. A special meal of these tokens is eaten when the with the fetus being reserved for the elders. The next day, the whole group go together to haul the meat back to camp. <coughs> Often after a successful hunt, as well as to mark other special occasions, a feast Feasts may mark the first kill of a season. Of the, we had several feasts during the course of the winter in, in the bush. Uh, they mark the, the first time we killed uh, a particular animal of a particular species that year. The first time a young man, and in, in that case, I was the only one in, in the camp. Uh, I was the first moose <coughs> I ever killed in my life. So a special. Um, a special feast was held for me. I was just, it's this kind of status, of, uh, status mark for young men. The present, um, where are we? The final, okay. Um, other feasts mark social occasions. This picture, for example, is a feast to celebrate the birth of a child. This is some of the feast food in a special um, cake. That color because it's fever blood mixed with the, with the flowers, so with all the sort of delicacy of the, the uh, special things that people like to cook or serve to the feast. The final phase of showing respect to an animal is to make sure, after all the meat and other parts of the animal have been consumed, that any remaining bones or antlers are preserved as sacred material. It is especially important that these bones and antlers are not, should not be allowed to be gnawed by dogs. This preservation is done in various ways, such as by tying the skulls to a tree. Those are two bear skulls. Bear, uh, among, right across North America, have a very special relationship, although I argued caribou are even more important in Labrador, to, to the Labrador end of it, uh, space of plastic, space of honor. People passing these skills would often put a, an offering of tobacco in the nasal cavity as a, as a respect to the um, So they're uh, tying the skulls to a tree. Uh, in some camps, a special pole was erected special pole, looking like, it's called a flagpole, but the word in Eno means a false tree, a uh, mystic one. A, um, anyway, there's a few, you see a few beaver, beaver skulls uh, tied to it. Um, uh, a special pole, or putting them on a special bone platform, 
or finally dropping them in a lake or river through a hole in the ice. To end my talk, I must say, speaking as a non Eno, I found living with Eno hunters very satisfying. I'll just show a couple of slides. This is kind of countryside. It is a way of life that offered participants many kinds of valuable experiences, both material and intellectual. Some parts of these traditions are still practiced to this day, although many of those I have spoken about today have now fallen out of use. Now, I, uh, I guess we should um, take questions. Got other um, stories to tell if, you know, <laughs> if, if, if there are no questions. Uh -huh. uh, you said that they don't return to their or to the place of last year for many years. But what was surprising to me is that the reason was not the availability of animals, but the availability of other raw materials. Yes. Yeah. So, the animals will repopulate mostly. Um, you know, providing they've, you know, there are two ways. What I found was in the southern areas of the Mastesni, uh, people would indeed return after a few years. They have a kind of cycle of, of they'd use their hunting territory uh, uh, like a farmer using rotational uh, harvesting um, and return to the same area. But they wouldn't return to the same uh, large site. Uh, again, I'm arguing because it takes much longer for moss, for example. The moss, which, as I say, is, is important for two purposes chinking the, uh, insulating the, the lodge, and for diapers for babies. Moss, the phyllosphagnum moss <coughs> that they use, it's been discovered, has an antiseptic. Quality that prevents diaper rash. So it is, uh, it is important to the women to have access to moss. Um, so that moss would take years to recover. So you wouldn't return to the exact same place where you'd be hauling moss from too far away. So that's my argument there um, as to why, you know, my understanding, shall we say, why they don't return to reoccupy the lodge. Now, Today, everything has changed. They have permanent plywood wall uh, cabins. Uh, there are four-wheel drive tracks and ATV tracks. They're returning again and again, and this creates problems of overuse of the territory close, close in and having to go further and further away to get plywood, to get, uh, to get to, uh, moss is not so much people use commercial diapers. Uh, no longer uh, that, but I'm talking at the time 50 years ago. That was my understanding of why they didn't return to, to those same areas. Thank you very much. It's fascinating. One particular question, if I may, and another general. I, I saw from your picture that the boobs are dismembered, cut off from. That's just broad as a whole thing. They, they're still covered with fur. The fur on the legs of both moose and caribou is particularly resistant to, to losing their hair. Uh -huh. And 
And so they use those, they have leg skin bags. I can sh show you uh, pictures of bags I collected made up of leg skin. Leg skin uh, for them was, was important because we leave the hair on. You didn't have to remove the hair. It wouldn't come off uh, naturally. So you get the use of leg. Then they would remove the bone. The hooves themselves would be not much interest for that. But, you know, they would be boiled and, and eventually put on the bone platform or something like that. But uh, now the second question: They make offerings. You know, one thing when I was first um, when I first told people in the village of Mistissima, people who should have known, uh, you know, the trader who, who visited their camps a lot. Uh, when I said, well, I want to study their traditional sacred spiritual ideas, no, no, it's all followers. They're all Christians. There's nothing left. <laughs> You're wasting your time. As soon as I got there, when you knew what to look for, you would see, for example, uh, at a meal, somebody would put a, 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 a little bit of their, their meal into the fire. And perhaps you would hear them say some phrase that was an offering. It was an offering. But these, as I understood it, are always offerings either to the animal spirits or to spirits representing forces of nature, the Chiwetan Chiwe or the, the old man of the north, which controls the north winds and the snow and various other things like that, but is also credited with also being important to, to supplying the food with animals. Uh, those were the offerings made. I didn't see there's talk about ancestors. There's recognition whenever you pass a place where uh, an ancestor was either buried or some event happened. So they're alive in their memories at least. But their memories are pr their, the genealogies that I was able to collect are pretty shallow. People do not have long genealogies in this area. They, uh, so that um, uh, honoring ancestors uh, is, is certainly a function there, but it is not so much part of the ceremonial life show. So. Mm -hmm. I have uh, two very different questions. One, I like to give my idea of people who are not hunting more than what they need. It really sounds like the good old social <laughs> ideals <laughs> of the kibbutzim, you know? right, yeah. <laughs> But I'm sure that they have social differences, economic differences. So how how it was created? They have corporates. Mm -hmm. So how these differences between families, between different social economic structures, struggle, how they develop? Uh, they have property property, they have ways to get more income. And the other very simple question that they have is what the dogs are eating. Yes. There. Uh, yeah. On the as I saw it fifty years ago, it was extremely egalitarian. Certainly you had people who had reputations as hunters, you had people who had reputations as having been shamans, as having a spiritual leadership, and you had political leaders. Even by then, you know, at that time it was mainly negotiating with the Hudson Bay Company. You know, today there's all kinds of uh, bureaucracy dealing with governments and leaders. Now you certainly see the rise of inequality. as they've settled in the community. But at the time I was there, we saw very little signs at the material level of inequality. Moreover, as nomadic hunters, you can't accumulate property. You've got to drag it around with you. You just have a hell of a more dark team to, to carry the stuff from one camp to the next, and sort of thing. Now, apparently people had several did have two old wives in the past, not you know, before they became Christian, uh, and that had, had ended by the time I got there. And so, um, and I'd previously worked with, with the Inuit, 
who what, at a time when parole bias was, was still a possibility. I mean, that was a status elevation. Someone who had several women doing all the, all the work and, and, and that sort of, sort of thing. So, you know, there were in, intimations of the kind of in, uh, social inequality and so forth stab of difference that you were referring to. But it was almost non existent. Uh, very, very, very good. Your second question? Um, Sorry, about the dogs. Oh, what the dogs eat. Several of the animals they hunt, particularly fur bearers, are not edible to humans. I mean, so they'll get a bit of cartridges. That people actually also used to bring oatmeal in the bush and, and feed the dogs partly on oatmeal if there wasn't enough meat and, and various other things. They don't mind feeding the dogs scraps of meat. It's the bones that are sacred and the animal will be offended if, if a dog ever gnawed on one of its bones. Uh, that, that's and again, these are rules and in all societies some people don't follow the rules as closely as they ought to. I'm not saying that Everybody is perfectly, you know, you do see bones lying around uh, in, 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 in some camps. Some young people are said to not know the rules and, and, and not follow them strictly. So I'm not saying dogs don't ever get a chance to eat something that in the strict interpretation of their rules they shouldn't be allowed. You find that like in Israel, the people who cannot hunt and have no spiritual powers of becoming political leaders. We're in a era in Canada of <coughs> reconciliation and recognition of indigenous rights and, and that the Cree in particular were very successful in using whatever and you know teams of lawyers uh, and I've testified in court cases uh, uh, that, that established uh, rights for themselves. So politics and political relations with the government are now, today, uh, pretty much a part of your life, but not at the time when you take the What What is the role of, of uh, uh, food that is not made? How is it? Uh, how is it consumed uh, seasonally? Mm -hmm. I guess there are seasons that you don't have much chances. But what is the role of vegetables? Very, very minor. Um, there are, well, certainly in terms of the indigenous uh, diets, uh, they have berries of various kinds, but only in the summer. However, those berries often will freeze. It first snowfall, stay frozen all winter, and we pick berry, fresh blueberries in the spring just as the snow melts. So you, you do get some stretching of the, of the season, but the boreal forest, you know, the people, I don't know people eat mushrooms, for example. You know, they, 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 so people don't really, and you know, as they become familiar with white men, white men's food, they would turn their nose up at vegetables. <laughs> just pre -Indian. just meat gives you, you know, as Stephenson showed, all the nutrition, all the vitamins, the survival, you need everything. You've got to eat the guts, you've got to eat the liver, the, you've got to have a complete, um, consume all parts of the animal. To get full nutrition, I but I ate the same as everybody else. Now we did have, did we say, sunflower, tea, sugar, uh, uh, stuff like that in small quantities. You know, they made a, a baking powder bread for fat. Uh, it's found that we've got all the milk, all the Indians and Inuit in Canada make forms of it either fried or So that a small amount of non-meat is eaten today, um, but uh, and it's, it's 
suppose the other thing, you know, I was saying about the utilitarian side of the union of the time I lived with them was that sharing was the dominant, not only the ideology of the sharing among the group. Each family kept its own larder. When an animal was killed, maybe the hunter who killed it would immediately give it, give it away, the whole thing away to his hunting partner, knowing that his hunting partner bringing it back would distribute to everybody. Everybody would get a share. But these larders would not always... And so you keep people kept an eye on their neighbors, and if they needed child would be sent with a gift, and this included European traded food, you know, the family would run each other flour. Uh, uh, their neighbors would, would help them out, and the same with, with, with neighbors, which was subject to much more formal, if you like, set of, set of rules of sharing. Um, Oh yes, yes, and this is by the by the time I was there, there was a nursing station, but everybody knew the, the old cures that we used. They preferred to go to the nurse if they were close by, uh, but otherwise they had various recipes involving either particular plants uh, or particular animal parts. Um, for example, my wife was in the bush, she's a linguist, researching on the um, on, on a free language, and cut her foot with an axe. They treated it with the, the scent glands of a beaver, uh, and it healed without any spell. Amazing. Uh, so they, they have these, and right now there's a lot of concern among them to recover that and, and, and document that medical knowledge, the traditional medical knowledge. Uh, and there's even attempts to patent some of these medicines because they, they, they feel that, 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 that they might have a commercial um, side to them. So yes, there were forms of medicine. In the bush, but as soon as they got access to modern medicine, they, they, it, it, there was no kind of sacredness about this traditional medicine. They just happened to switch to the European form of the other way Yeah, I know about this partly because I was a child in a sense. Uh, as many anthropologists experience, I was adopting into a family, but people knew it, and, uh, and so I was I slept in the order of my 15th birthday, or as uh, you know, I fitted, it was fitted into the family structure. Uh, as with, with children, I was expected to follow the hunters. Or follow the people making, you know, when we were making camp. Uh, <coughs> for the first month or so, I was expected to simply watch and that. And the same with children. They know the, the, the Inu in general have what we call a respect for the autonomy of the individual. So even children are never told what to do. They are never punished for not doing except they where it, it actually endangers them. And then afterwards not, they will just tie a string to the back of a child so he can't walk and touch the stone. I mean, that's what I think, you know. Um, do it by by discipline and, and rules and that. They just prevent them from or the other thing going outside without being properly clothed and, and that sort of thing. They know that children need to be watched, but but other than that, they respect the autonomy even of small children who, who may do crazy things, but, but as long as it doesn't harm them or anyone else. Uh, but 
And so with that respect for the economy, it's watching what children will show an interest in and, and encouraging that. And then after a while saying, why don't you go and do this? And they would, the child would go off and build something. I mean, first of all, they would do as we do with our children, have a little bit of imitation. Uh, the child with a little backpack there, and pretty soon they're gathering moss. Uh, the, the, the children would go along and carry a bit of moss. This is even symbolized in a ritual called the walking out ceremony. When a child is old enough to walk on its own, a ceremony is held in which the child is led on a path of or boughs laid on the ground with an artificial tree erected at the end of the path from the tent door. Uh, and the child carries symbols of its gender. A boy will have either a gun or a toy, an axe or a, um, a bone arrow or something like that. The, uh, and will pick up something from under the tree, like a, a, a game, uh, a piece of a, a dead animal and bring it back into the tent and, and give it to its parents and grandparents and peace will be kept and the similarly for, for a, a female child. Um, usually um, you dive a bunch of spruce boughs which we then collect or a firewood or something like that. So um, yes, the children are to some degree in the ease symbolic and in real forms indoctrinated into what their role will be in, in the culture, but never in the in an authoritarian way. And I found this a very I mean I learned a lot from here about things like I like that Can you say something about the animal, the caribou? What makes the caribou such an important uh, animal for the Inu? Uh, In Labrador, yes. Yeah, this it is says a... like the beaver is more tastier and more. Uh... Oh, no. <laughs> well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Anyway, a caribou meat is delicious. <laughs> Yeah, it is such a predominant animal, both spiritually as well as material. Caribou have extraordinary qualities. The, the, the fur, the, 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 each individual fur is hollow. It's the, it's the most efficient form of insulation. Some people have written that it's better than, than goose, uh, you know, than, than, than um, high, um, Goose feathers and uh, that for for um, and and people more you know up, up until the early twentieth century we had photographs of people dressed in the caribou right. so it wasn't just the meat it wasn't and then you had this extraordinary veneration of the fat of of, of, of the caribou uh, I think when you look at the the other thing about Labrador is you're getting into treeless, a mixture of treed and treeless environment where there are relatively few of the other animals that are found in much more dense qualities in the, on the James Bay side, so beaver in particular. Moose were never in the Labrador area. They are just starting to move into that area. Moose seem to have been moving their range uh, quite radically over the past 50 years or so. Caribou, on the other hand, are also, uh, um, for reasons that biologists cannot seem to explain, have gone through two, at least two in living memory, two dramatic declines and recoveries. That particular herd, the 
George River herd. It used to be the largest herd of caribou in the world. It's dropped now to some 10% of what it, what it used to be. We know that also happened in the late 1800s, early 1900s, where there was complete collapse of that herd and starvation as a result of it. But people in that region, the Inu of that region, are so dependent on caribou, at least prior to European social assistance, you know, government social assistance and that. And this is what happened, in fact, when that first decline in the caribou uh, took place, people were forced to move to the coast and depend on handouts from the government. And this is at an early stage when this wasn't a regular thing. Uh, so that, um, so that I'm not sure, and the Inu certainly have legends and explanations for what happens when the caribou disappear as they or decline and are extremely hard to find. Now, during those periods, there is some kind of starvation foods. Um, uh, um, you know, people try to subsist on the um, Arctic hares, and, and fish is a fairly dependable source where you have uh, adequate lakes and rivers. Um, because as I explained, you can you know, catch fish throughout the winter. Uh, and so there's a kind of, sub people can go into a survival mode when caribou are not available. Uh, but, um, but certainly culturally, caribou is, you know, understanding is, 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 is absolutely Central to their way of life and is venerated and not just uh, dealt with as an important animal nutritionally, but also in many other ways a, a sacred animal that, uh, that they, these relations of, of friendship and um, exchange of. reciprocity between the, the human hunters and that. When that breaks down, this is the Eno you know, explanation of what happens when you can't kill caribou, is somebody has offended the rules, the caribou withdraw. Uh, and in many myths, they actually go underground, they go mm -hmm. into a mountain, they just disappear, and there are whole legend, legends that are, are uh, supposedly not just myths, Master the caribou to release the animals and allow them to hunt again. So that, um, uh, you know, uh, it, it, um, it, it's, we're dealing here part, part with nature and part with culture over the same issue of the abundance or lack of it of caribou. Um, and you know, have their own. Explanations and scientists seem to be unable to. I mean, there are two possible. There, there are a number of theories of what happens to caribou. One, one is the icing of the tundra phenomenon. What may happen in the cold, in the middle of a cold winter, you'll have a very warm snap and actual rain. The rain will then freeze on the, on the top of the snow and form a crust of ice, and the caribou, who's normal pattern is to use these big hooves they have to shovel away the snow and get to the caribou moss underneath, is, which is their regular diet year round. So, you know, there's some moss on the trees they can get at uh, as well. But um, the one theory would be that, that if an icing of the tundra occurs, it may cause mass starvation. The other relates to where females, where the females assemble to have their calves uh, at one particular spot. And uh, if suddenly the optimal condition or the suitable conditions for, for 
female carving is no longer present there and they haven't got anywhere else to turn. You know, they're too late to die. You have a very high uh, mortality rate of young caribou. I mean, that's, but, um, so I really, you know, I, it, it's, your question is, is a question of me also. Something I'm struggling myself to understand. That, that, that total depend or apparent total dependence or, or very large dependence on character, which is not, as I say, just for meat, but as a spiritual. Thank you very much.